Hey all, Professor Tracy here again from Law Simply Explained. This is the lecture on consideration. Before we get into the doctrine of consideration itself, let's recap what we covered in the introductory lesson about promises. So we defined a promise as having three elements. We said that first it must have a manifestation of an intention. So meaning that it is an outward expression from the promisor. So either spoken word or written word or conduct that is expressing an intention to act or not act in a specified way. That is a commitment to do or not do something. So, but we said that with the third element, we're asking, well, is the promisee actually justified in understanding this manifestation from the promisor as indeed being a commitment to act or not act in a specified way. And we said we judge that objectively, right? We don't, we don't try to read the mind of the promisor and say, what is it that the promisor intended when they uttered this word or wrote these words or you know, engaged in this conduct? Instead, we're saying, how would that conduct be understood objectively or those words be understood objectively? Would they be viewed as having been about making a commitment to act or not act in a particular way. And we said when we're looking at words, at, we're looking at those and giving the words their ordinary meaning and giving any technical words their technical meaning and giving those words meaning in the context of all the surrounding circumstances. And those are kind of the basic tools of interpretation that will return through to throughout contract law, but we will look at those tools in more detail and indeed look at other tools uh, to determine how we interpret a contract. But those are the basic ones that we need to have at hand when we're trying to ask, how do we understand a manifestation from a promisor? And when we look at promises, we said we need to break them down into two types. There are contractual promises, which are legally enforceable, and gratuitous promises, which as a general matter are not legally enforceable. We said a contractual promise is a promise from the promisor to the promisee in which there is a pro either a return promise coming back to the promisor or a return per performance. And so we said it's part of an exchange or a contract. So the promisor is making the promise with the expectation that the promisee will give a promise back or a performance back. So that makes it part of what we call a bargain or an exchange and ultimately what we would call a contract. And we said that gratuitous promises are different because they're one-sided. The promisor is making the promise without any expectation of the promisee giving any kind of return promise or return performance. It's what we would refer to as a naked or a bare promise that to which we would say, well, that's gratuitous. And as a general rule, it's not legally enforceable. And so we can look at an example here with our good friends, Barb and Bob. And here Bob says to Barb, I'll take you to Golden Corral for dinner on Thursday. So Bob is a hopeless romantic. And um, we're asking, well, is that phrase, that manifestation from Bob, that outward expression of spoken word, is that a promise? We can say, well, yes, it's a manifestation of an intent, right? He's saying, I intend to what? To take you to Golden Corral on Friday. So he's saying, I am intending to take you to Golden Corral on, on not Friday, Thursday. And we have to say, well, is, is Barb justified in viewing these words from Bob as being a commitment? And the answer is yes, right? You look at the ordinary meaning of his words. He's saying what? I will take you to Golden Corral for dinner on Thursday. Those are kind of typical words that are used to express a commitment to do something, right? He's not saying, I hope, or if the stars align, or something like that, right? It's Those are clear words with their ordinary meaning to say, yes, 
all these elements are in fact met. So he's made a promise and as it stands, he didn't make that promise, at least the way it's phrased, that he expected anything back from Barb, either a return promise from her, return performance. There's nothing. And in fact, Barb gives nothing. So we know it's not part of an exchange. And therefore, we'd say it's gratuitous. It's not a contractual promise. So that means it would not be legally enforceable. So if Bob reneges on his promise, Barb would not be able to legally enforce that promise. And keep in mind, I'm setting aside the issue of, well, what about the fact that Barb and Bob may be friends and this may be in a social context, et cetera? Doesn't that just make it unenforceable as a general matter? And the answer is it may. We'll come back to that issue later. For now, I'm just intending these to be kind of fun hypotheticals as a way to understand what we mean by gratuitous promise and contractual promise. So with example two here, Bob says, Barb, if you don't miss any classes this week, I will take you to Golden Corral for dinner next Thursday. So now we still have that the words, I will take you to Golden Corral for dinner next Thursday, which we already said is a promise, but he's now making that promise to Barb, the promise C, with an expectation of getting something back from her, right? A commitment that she won't miss any classes this week. So we know, yes, he's made a promise. It's the same as in the first example, right? All the elements are met, but he's made it expecting to get something in return. And so when Barb gives a return promise and says, great, I'll be sure not to miss any classes this week. That's her making a return promise. That also meets the definition of a promise, right? We can go back and look at the language and she says, I'll be sure, right? I'll be sure to do this, right? She's making a commitment. Her, the ordinary meaning of her words are, she's made a manifestation. These are spoken words. She's saying, I have the intent not to miss any classes, right? Meaning I will be there. You could look at that either as her saying, I won't skip class or I will be there, right? It doesn't really matter how we view it. And the ordinary meaning of those words would mean that a reasonable person would think that Barb had made a commitment there. So we'd say, yes, she made a return promise, which we've shown. And so when we look at these promises, then with Bob's promise, we'd say it's contractual, right? It's part of an exchange. He made the promise with an expectation of getting a return promise and he got that return promise. So it's part of an exchange. And so actually, no matter which promise we look at here, both of them would be considered contractual, right? Because Barb is making the promise to Bob in response to his promise. So there is an exchange of promises, no matter which promise we're looking at, they're both contractual and therefore legally enforceable, right? That means that Barb can sue Bob to legally enforce his promise to take her to Golden Corral. And Bob can sue Barb to legally enforce, enforce her promise that she won't miss any classes. So this lesson, we're going to dive in a little and say, well, when we say something is part of an exchange or a bargain, what exactly do we mean by that, right? We're going to look at what is the nature of the exchange that's required. And that's what consideration is, is about, is the exchange that's at the heart of every contract. So we have this kind of general framework or chart here we can look at where on the left side there we have the definition of a promise. If we say we have a promise, remember the next step is saying, is that promise contractual, meaning it's part of a contract or an exchange, or is it gratuitous? And noting if it's gratuitous, that means that it's not legally enforceable. So if we're following through kind of the, our chain of logic here, we're assuming in this lesson that yes, we've got a promise that it's intended to be contractual, meaning that it's intended to be part of an exchange. And then we laid out this analytic framework in our first lesson. And we said that, well, how do we know for sure it's part of an exchange? or part of a contract, well, we need all the elements of a contract to be met.
And so we would set focus today in this lesson on consideration, consideration, because that is the exchange that we're referring to that makes up consideration. And so let's look at that and look at our definition here. The definition is here straight out of the restatement, it, it, our basic definition at least, is every contract requires consideration on both sides of the transaction. Consideration consists of what? One, a bargain for exchange between the parties, and two, that which is bargained for must be of legal value. So just as we've done with other definitions, we need to chunk it or break it up into elements. So our first element would be that we need consideration on both sides of the transaction and that we define consideration as being one, a bargain for exchange and two, that the thing being exchanged is of legal value. So we look at our rules of consideration. We need it on both sides and the, it, it is a bargain for exchange between the parties and that which is bargained for must be of legal value. We're going to unpack those elements as we go through. So consideration on both sides. So what we mean by that, if we go back to example one, remember that was our gratuitous promise where Bob was just making a gratuitous promise to Barb to take her to Golden Corral on Thursday. He made that promise without getting anything in exchange from Barb and really with no expectation that he would. So we said there was no consideration for, or that it's gratuitous. And we can add on that and say, not only is it gratuitous, but it is, um, there's, that means there's no consideration for it, right? Because it's not part of an exchange. There's nothing coming back to Bob. It's a one-sided promise. It's a naked promise, which is gratuitous and not enforceable. So in this case, we'd say there isn't consideration on both sides. If we look at the second example where Bob promises Barb to take her to Golden Corral if she doesn't miss any classes this week, then he's making that promise with the expectation that Barb is going to commit not to miss any classes. And so in this case, we have a promise coming back to Bob from Barb. So he's made the promise, getting a promise in return. That return promise is considered the consideration for Bob's promise to take her to Golden Corral. And we could say the same thing about Barb's promise and Bob's return promise. So the consideration for her promise is Bob's promise to take her to Golden Corral. So we would say there is consideration then on both sides in that instance. So bargain for exchange between the parties. So we've established that, well, we need consideration. And basically that means something's got to be coming back to the promisor. But what exactly do we mean by that? We've used the word bargain or that it needs to be part of an exchange or part of a contract. Well, let's unpack that. So when we look at consideration, here's our definition kind of charted out that it's a bargain for exchange of something of legal value. And those are the, the two other parts of our definition, right? That we looked at here, that, that we have a bargain for exchange between the parties and that which is bargained for must be of legal value. That's here as well, right? So we can see that. And we're gonna focus on the bargain for exchange part of it first. And what we mean by that is that the promisor's promise must induce a detriment from the promisee. And the promisee's detriment must be what induced or motivated the promisor to make the promise in the first place. So we'll look at that. Well, what do we mean? When we say a bargain for exchange, then we just said it has two parts, that the promisor's promise induces the promisee's detriment meaning that the detriment the whatever it the return promise coming from the promisee or the return performance is induced by the promisor's promise so 
what and what do we mean by a detriment in this case it's easy to think of detriment as like well the detriment is bad it's harmful that's not how we're using the word in this case it could be something painful or harmful but it doesn't have to be and in this case or what we mean by it is that the promisee is obligating themselves to do something or to undertake a performance that they were not otherwise legally obligated to do. So they're, they're committing themselves to do something, making a return promise to do something they were not otherwise obligated to do, or undertaking a return performance they were not otherwise obligated to undertake. So that's what we mean by a detriment. So the promisor makes a promise and it induces a detriment from the promisee. And the second part of it is that that detriment is what prompted the promisor to make the promise in the first place, right? That's what induced them to make the promise. That's what they wanted. And so we can see how this works. And when we think of a detriment, we said we've been using, explaining it this way already without kind of nailing it down, which is, it's either the detriment from the promisee is either going to be a return promise, in which case we would say the contract is a promise for a promise, meaning the promise or made a promise and it induced a return promise from the promisee. So the, the return promise is a detriment. And when we have a promise for a promise, it's a bilateral contract. We'll talk more about the ramifications of what it means that a contract is bilateral in a later lesson. But the other possibility is that the promise from the promisor induces a return performance, that the detriment is a return performance rather than just a return promise, in which case we call that a unilateral contract. And we'll look at examples of both of these in just a second. So when we're asking, you know, is there a bargain for exchange? Well, let's look to see what does it mean that the promise induces the detriment and the detriment induces the promise. So let's look at an example here. Bob says, Barb, I will mow your lawn on Friday at 2 p.m. if you will pay me $20. So Bob has made a promise there to mow Barb's lawn, right? We could run through the elements and they would be met, right? It's a manifestation, meaning an outward expression, a spoken word to Barb where he's committing to mow Barb's lawn on Friday. And, but he's making it with a hope to induce a detriment from Barb, right? Which is that he wants a return promise from her that she will pay him $20. So we have a promise from Bob the promisor to Barb the promisee. And so we then get this back from Barb, which is, Bob, that sounds great. I'd be happy to pay you $20 to mow my lawn. So she is saying, great, I agree to what you've proposed, the exchange, and I am going to promise to pay you $20 if you mow my lawn. So she is obligating herself to pay Bob $20. We have no facts saying she's otherwise obligated to pay Bob $20. So she's incurring a detriment. So Bob's promise is inducing a detriment from Barb, which is this return promise, right? That's the detriment from Barb. And so we would say, okay, the Bob the promisee's promise induced a detriment from the promisee Barb. And we then have to say, well, let's go to the next step before we say, is it, you know, where does it fit on our, our, our chart there with the different kinds of detriments? We have to say, okay, what is the second part meant, right? We can say the promisor's promised induced a detriment from Barb. She made a return promise, right? Which we would say, yes, that makes it bilateral. It's a promise for a promise. And so we can say, yes, that part is met. Is, is that why he made the promise, right? And let's go back and look at that really quickly. The answer is yes, right? If we go all the way back and see what he said, he said, Barb, 
I will mow your lawn on Friday at 2 p.m. if you will pay me. So his promise to mow Barb's lawn on Friday is made for the purpose of trying to get a, a, that particular detriment, right? He's motivated to promise to mow her lawn on Friday at 2 p.m. because he wants a promise from Barb to pay her $20. So we know that not only did his promise induce a detriment, right? So we can say, yes, the, the promise induces the detriment, right? Bob's promise induces a detriment from Barb, so we can check that off. But also that Barb's detriment, that return promise, is what induced Bob's promise to begin with, right? That's why he made his promise to begin with. That's what motivated him to make the promise to begin with. And if both are present, and we need both of them, not just one, if both are present, we have a bargain for exchange. And so we would say, okay, there's a bargain for exchange between the parties. And indeed, we could say there's also consideration. Let's look at another example, though, where Barb sends out these signs and flyers that say, lost dog, answers to Minnie, call 555-55555, reward upon return to owner. So she's made a promise, right? In this sign or flyer, she's made a promise that I will pay $500 to the person who returns my dog to me. So that's a promise of a $500 reward. And so we have a promise again. It's an outward manifestation, an outward expression uh, of her spoken, or in this case, written word, excuse me, that she intends to, uh, to pay a $500 reward to the person who returns her dog to her. So now Bob finds a dog. Barb, here. I found your dog, Minnie. So he has the dog, he's returned it, and so he found the dog. And one of the things we have to wrestle with here is this, what is it that Barb was looking for? She was saying, I will pay $500 to the person who finds my dog. She's not looking, the, the promise is, is it made to induce a detriment? to the promise from the promise see yes but that detriment unlike the previous example where bob was looking for a return promise of you know getting paid twenty dollars here she doesn't want just a promise from somebody that oh yes don't worry i promise to find your dog well that doesn't do her any good right all kinds of people could call her up and say, I promise to find your dog. Well, thanks, but that's not helpful. What she wants is for somebody to actually perform. So this is what she's looking for. The detriment she wants from Bob here is a return performance, not a return promise. And so he does perform. He finds Barb's dog and brings it to her. So in this case, that return performance from Bob is his detriment. So we can say this is falls under the second type of detriment. It's a return performance. And again, we will unpack this more and the ramifications that come from it, but just know that that's what was going on with that offer of a reward. And so here we could say, did Barb make a promise that induced a detriment from Bob? Yes, she made a promise of a reward. It induced it induced a return performance from Bob. And then we can say, well, is that perform that detriment, that return performance of finding the dog, what induced her to promise to make the reward in the beginning, in the first place? The answer is yes, right? That's why she promised the reward. So the answer is yes, her uh, that detriment, that return performance, is what induced her to make her promise in the first place. So we have a bargain for exchange, and we can say, yes, there's a bargain for exchange between Bob and Barb. So we now need to look, though, at that second part, right, of our, of our consideration chart, and what is noted here in the rule is that whatever's being exchanged between the parties must be of legal value. And so when we say legal value, well, what do we mean? What do we mean by that? So 
if we say we have, you know, we have a bargain for exchange, just as we looked at with the lawn mowing example and with the lost dog example, we also need to ask, well, is that which is being exchanged of legal value? And well, how do we know? Well, it can be one of two possible things, right? It can either be that the thing being exchanged, the return promise or the, the performance or the promise is must either be of something of benefit to the promisor, to the person who made the promise. In our first example, to Bob, who promised to mow Barb's lawn, or in the other example with the lost dog, to Barb, who promised to pay the reward. It, we're asking, is that which is being exchanged, given back, the return perform performance or the return promise of, is it a benefit to the promisor or, or we don't need both, or is it a detriment to the promisee? And that second one is really kind of built into the first part of our definition, right? That is it a bargain for exchange? We said that the promisor's promise must induce a detriment from the promise C. So the answer is very likely to be yes, right? But so we can pretty easily satisfy the second part of our consideration our consideration definition here. But often we don't need both possibilities, but often they will be met, right? Both will be met. So uh, we were asking, is this detriment, right? If we're looking at the typical situation where the promisor makes a promise to the promisee, and then that induces a detriment from the promisee. And it's either return performance or return promise. We're gonna ask, well, is that detriment something that's beneficial to the promisor? Or, and, and or is it a detriment to the promisee? And so, what do we mean by that, right? It's an or, remember, unlike the bargain for exchange where we need both, we don't need both here. So if we go back to this lawn mowing example, right, where we said Bob has made a promise to Barb to mow her lawn and Barb has made a promise to pay him $20 for doing so, we have to ask, well, is that of any legal value to Bob? And that we said it's gotta be one of two things, right? Either it's a detriment to Barb or it's a benefit to Bob. And remember, it's a detriment, why? It's a detriment because Barb is obligating herself legally in a way that she wasn't already obligated, right? There's no rule in the universe that says Bob has to pay Barb $20. If there were, then it wouldn't be an obligation that she's adding to herself. She would already be obligated to do it. But here, there are no facts suggesting that. So it is in fact a detriment to, to Barb. And we have to say, well, is it of benefit to Bob? And the answer is yes, right? It's both, it's both. That's why I have an and here, we don't need an and. But yes, obviously it's beneficial to him to have a legally enforceable promise from Barb to pay him $20. And it's also a detriment to her, as we just explained, because she's now obligated herself at, at, through a contractual promise to pay Bob $20, which is a commitment she didn't have before. And so we would say, well, both things are met. It's both a benefit to Bob the promisor and it's a detriment to promise. See, we don't need both, but we have both, right? It's an or, but we have both here. And so we know if that's true, then we can say that here with the lawn mowing example, that what has been bargained for is in fact of legal value. So all the elements would be met. So if we go back to our big chart here and kind of summing this up, that this is just the chart we looked at the beginning of the lesson where we said, we're asking, is there a promise? Yes, is it contractual in nature? Meaning is it part of an exchange? like with the lost dog or with the, uh, the commitment to mow the lawn for $20. And so to understand for sure, if it's part of a contract or an exchange, we have to ask, well, is there consideration? Meaning that is this promise made in, in order to induce a detriment from the promisee? And did, is that detriment 
what motivated them, and was it in fact given, right? Was that detriment actually induced by the promise from the promisor? And then is that detriment something of benefit to the promisor? Or is it, uh, is it something we would say is in fact a detriment to the promisee? So if so, then we know we have consideration. Now, there is much more to be said about consideration. And we will look at some of the other rules concerning consideration in our next two lessons. But for now, that's the basics of consideration. You want to think of it as our consideration rule is that the promise from the promisor must be part of a bargain for exchange of something of legal value. And to know that, we run through our elements there on the right side. So hopefully that is in fact helpful. As I said, there are more lessons coming where we will dig into this rule concerning consideration even more. If this video was helpful to you, if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. There's certainly more on the way. Um, and I wish you the best of luck in your studies.